Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Investment Management Operations. This show explores the inner workings of the most sophisticated institutions in the industry. Through conversations with executives across operations, compliance, legal, and finance, you'll hear how key operating partners run their businesses in an ever-changing and complex investment landscape. You can join our mailing list and access Capital Allocators content at capitalallocators.com. I'm Scott McDonald, and I'm your host. My guest on today's show is Lauren Dillard. Lauren Dillard is the CFO of Vista Equity Partners, a private equity firm with over $96 billion in assets under management and over 20 years investing exclusively in enterprise software. Before joining Vista, she was the executive vice president of NASDAQ's investment intelligence division, where she led the company's efforts for its index business, including data and analytics. Prior to NASDAQ, Lauren spent 17 years at Carlisle, where she served as the head of the Investment Solutions Unit and was a member of the management committee. During our time together, we covered Lauren's early career in tax accounting at Arthur Anderson and her unexpected move into private equity following the collapse of Enron. We discussed some career lessons learned during her transitions to Carlisle, NASDAQ, and eventually Vista. We discussed the dynamics of being an investment management executive, operational flexibility, outsourcing versus insourcing, and internal deal processes. We close on the increasing sophistication of LPs and GPs and the importance of a growth mindset. Please enjoy my conversation with Lauren Dillard. Lauren, it's great to see you. It's great to see you, Scott. I'd love to hear about the story behind your career path. Well, I started my career at Arthur Anderson and I was in the tax division. I'm a big believer that whether it's the big four or the banks or the consulting firms that You have to start your career at a place where you just learn how to be a professional and you learn how to learn and you learn how to show up in meetings and you learn how to do presentations. I will say I am very fond of Arthur Anderson. I had wonderful mentors. They were very early in the development, training, all about learning how to learn. And Arthur Anderson did a really good job. I was there during the Enron crisis. After Arthur Anderson went away in 2002, I joined Carlisle. One door closes, one door opens. Like, how do you reflect on that right now? I will say it felt enormous at the time. And so for anyone early in their career, things happen. That doesn't mean it's the end of your career. I was incredibly fortunate to join Carlisle at a time when it was growing and it was still very early in its institutionalization. I think it had just started a fund in Europe and started a fund in Asia. I joined to work for the first CFO. I also worked for the general counsel who's still there, who way, way back in his time was a tax lawyer. So that was excellent for me. I learned a lot from him. And then I worked for the head of equity programs, which meant that I got to really work on the programs that the firm put in place as it expanded. So I really had a unique seat and three excellent people to learn from starting my career there. Whenever you join a firm that is growing, there are unique opportunities. I am a big believer that if you do your job and you do it very, very well and you keep delivering, that you will inevitably have more and more opportunities. And that's definitely what happened to me during the growth of Carlisle. That led up to the IPO. I worked on Carlisle's public offering, was fortunate enough to work with the CFO at the time, Medina Friedman. Glenn Youngkin was the COO and president. I worked closely with the founders. That was an incredibly interesting time. And there's a corollary probably with any major initiative at any organization, frankly, whenever you have a singular goal and the organization knows exactly what that goal is, everyone's rowing in the same direction, you can actually accomplish an enormous amount of work. And you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, we did that. But when you're in the middle of it, it feels big, but since everyone's rowing the same direction, it's quite a sense of accomplishment. Thereafter, the firm asked me to move up to New York to be the COO of a division they were putting together, the Investment Solutions Division. And they had bought three fund of funds. So a private equity fund of funds, Alpinvest, a real estate fund of funds called Metropolitan Real Estate. And then they were in the process of buying a hedge fund of funds platform. 
they described it as the COO of the division and they listed out what they thought the COO would be. And all the things they listed out, that job really wasn't, but it was a wonderful opportunity to learn the operations of a business. It was everything from why are we in three office spaces to how do we register our salespeople in Korea to what's going to be our sales story to how do we go to market to what's the P&L look like and where do we invest and what products do we need? So I learned an enormous amount. It's a great example of saying yes to an opportunity, even when you don't really know what it was. I ended up running that division and joined the management committee. And that is a classic story of, they sat me down and said, we want you to take over this division. It's a great opportunity. You're going to join the management committee. And I went through a laundry list of all the reasons why I didn't think it was best for me or the organization. And it was kind of like, you're going to do this. You will do it well. And I learned an enormous amount, really, really engaged with the deal teams at the time and the clients. And it was a fantastic learning opportunity. That conversion to going public, did it look differently for you from your seat? Well, at the time, there was only a few public alternative asset managers. There are obviously more now, and they've taken a different approach. And at the time, everybody was a publicly traded partnership, which meant that the tax aspects of it were very important. Now everybody's a C-Corp, which I think is a much better answer because now it's easier to understand and investors can invest. And frankly, now I think some of the C-Corps will end up in indices, which is excellent for them. I mean, it did change the face of the firm to some degree because then you go from just having LPs as your clients to having LPs and public shareholders. As you've looked back and watched all of the alternative asset managers deal with having that new set of shareholders, the alignment and making sure that things match up has been something that I think we've kind of watched them all mature. And then from there, you moved over to NASDAQ? I did. So as I mentioned, I had the fortunate experience of getting to work with Adina when she was Carlisle CFO. She had gone back to NASDAQ and was the CEO and still is the CEO. She was leading the strategic pivot of NASDAQ. When you think about NASDAQ, most people think about the exchange. They think about the listed companies. But she had rightfully recognized that NASDAQ was more than an exchange. It was truly a technology organization. It powered exchanges all over the world. And it had built out a large division called the Investment Intelligence Division. It was actually its fastest growing division that sold data and indexes and technology platforms to the investment community. Interestingly, it was a billion dollars of revenue plus and 700 people when I took the role. Of the 700 people, I think 699 knew more than me. So it was definitely a learning opportunity. I learned a lot from that seat. Were you a little nervous about leaving the private equity career behind to going outside industry? Yeah, it's a good question. I had a wonderful run at Carlisle. I was there for 17 years. I loved the firm. I knew everyone there. It was definitely a step outside my comfort zone. And I think one thing that's a thread in my career is being comfortable being uncomfortable and stepping outside my comfort zone. But I became a much better executive, frankly, during my time at NASDAQ because of that. I had to learn. I didn't know the products. I had to get very, very comfortable asking why, understanding go-to-market, the client profile. And it's super interesting now. There is definitely a convergence between the institutional asset management community, the alternative asset management community, and arguably even the retail investors. The institutional investors have always sat with both. And my time at NASDAQ has actually helped me see that convergence in a pretty unique way because I was there and I've spent time at private equity. It looks like it's teed you up quite nicely to find a role at Vista. It has. You know, it's interesting. When I was in my NASDAQ seat, I actually tried to buy one of the portfolio companies from Vista. I had always held Vista in just the highest regard as an enterprise software investor. And my jump to NASDAQ actually just reinforced how important I feel like enterprise software is to, frankly, the future of all sectors and data. And you're especially seeing that now. Vista is unique in its ecosystem. It is very, very vertical. It is vertical in its enterprise software expertise. It's created this ecosystem enterprise software, and it brings together what I did at NASDAQ and what I did at Carlisle. There's a common thread between all of it, not just the comfortable being uncomfortable, which is inclusive capital. I'm a big believer that within private equity, we work on behalf of 
the LPs, when you look at the LP base, you're talking about foundations that are literally changing the world. You're talking about your endowments of your schools. You're talking about your retirees and your pensioners. And that is by default creating returns and therefore driving inclusive capital. That same thread was at NASDAQ with access to data and access to diversity data at investment and access to indices, which allow you to get exposure to the market in a less expensive way. And retail brokers standing up so quickly so that you can actually access markets in a way that used to be more exclusive. It's now democratized. So that inclusive capital thread has gone through all of it. It's really important to me. That's great. And then going from NASDAQ to Vista, there must have been a big pickup in your skill set and knowledge. And how do you apply that to an organization like Vista? Taking over the CFO seat, I would say people think of CFOs as financial statements. And that is definitely a part of a CFO's role. But more and more, I think CFOs are operators. They're operationalizing processes. They're bringing in people. They're utilizing data in ways that have not in the past. And they're investing in the infrastructure of these firms. And having been at Carlisle through all the growth, and then now at Vista, as it institutionalizes, The technology and data that is available is so incredibly different than where I sat at Carlisle 20 years ago. And that is a huge opportunity, frankly, for anyone that's in this space. When I think back 20 years ago at Carlisle, and I will give the first CFO a lot of credit, he invested in very early technology, technology that frankly doesn't exist now and it definitely should not have. But it's interesting because at the time, in the alternative space, I think the institutional asset managers had always invested more heavily in technology, but you had to have an accounting system. And then you had to have a portal to deliver your information to your LPs. It is very strange to me that within the alternative space, we still deliver information to our limited partners in PDFs. At some point in time, that has to change. With the revolution, frankly, of data and how sophisticated now the LPs are, and our clients are, and the data that they're looking to have, and how many managers they have, at some point in time, we're just going to have to figure out how to crack that. Yeah. Is anybody cracking the code? Everyone is working on it. Frankly, we were working on it on the division at NASDAQ too. And it's interesting because I can feel the pull now that I'm in the CFO seat from our investors, the sheer number of investor requests the way that the investors want their information, whether templated or otherwise, is definitely a generation, if not two or three from years and years ago. I mean, think about you or me. If we're going to log on to whatever our platform is to look at your portfolio, you expect to see the data real time pulling in. It's the power of market data. It just doesn't exist in the alt space. But it's super interesting for me to see all the technology and data companies, fintech companies that are coming up trying to crack that nut, but also crack other issues. When you think about the challenges really across all operations at an alts firm, if you start from front office to back office, you've got to figure out your deal pipeline. And there's some great tools now that can track really interesting deal pipeline and companies and pipe in data that can actually leverage now the large learning models to actually identify investing opportunities and add-ons and acquisitions. And then you've got to have some sort of sourcing tool and CRM for your LPs. So you've got to know who your clients are, who the contacts are. And then you go more towards the middle office. And this is where I think there's been a lot of really interesting advancements in portfolio data. It used to be that we gathered all of our portfolio data and templates. And now we've implemented an excellent portfolio data tool. And there's quite a few new tools in that space. That really is the foundation that can allow us to take all of our portfolio data and the insights and share it with our investors. And that's really what they want to see. They want to understand in detail what's going on at our portfolio companies. It is that friction point around why are we still scraping PDFs in this? It's 2023. Isn't it fascinating? There's that meme. It's like the financial system is held up on Excel. I mean, Excel is a fabulous tool and it's really hard to unsee. It just shows how sticky processes can be. Turning to your early days at Vista, what was your first mandate? What were you charged to get done? I took over from the first CFO and Vista had experienced extraordinary growth, growth in assets, growth in portfolio company numbers, 
growth in strategies, growth in limited partners. So I would say, first of all, if I talked and I did to my fellow partners on the executive committee or my team or my fellow business partners and everyone had a slightly different take on mandate. But from my perspective, you unpacked all of it is how do we scale so that we can serve the organization, serve the partners within the organization, serve our customers, and frankly, serve the regulators, because there's a lot coming out of the regulators in a way that will allow the firm to scale. So I like to think of the CFO's office and finance, not as necessarily back office, but rather as a business enabler and business partner. I think that's really, really important. So that was really my mandate. Part of that is people, part of that is technology, and part of that is process. To scale as a strategic CFO, do you look forward and build out what you think might happen and backtrack, or is it something else? Every single firm is different, and every single firm has had different growth, and every single firm has had different priorities. So a little bit of it when I got here was, what was the growth? What were the priorities? And frankly, where did things pop up that I need to get my hands around as a CFO? I go back to core, who do you serve? I really think of in the rise of how many LPs we added, what were they asking for? What did they need? Everything from their standard reporting to bespoke reporting. And how do I get my hands around that? Because to me, that's core first and foremost. Then I cascaded all the priorities from there. There were things that I thought maybe should be a priority. I wanted the team to be on board. So I spent a lot of time with the team and our business partners, and then came up with a roadmap. I joined in April. We rolled the formal roadmap out to the team in July. We had worked on it as a leadership team from April till then. There's a one, three, and five-year roadmap. It must have been opportunistic and challenging because you came in knowing a little bit about the organization, but also a fresh perspective and like, how do you balance those? Yeah, I think that that actually is probably the number one lesson for anyone that's joining maybe any firm, but certainly an alts firm is, number one, they're all different. Number two, they all grew up with certain core principles and priorities and understanding the balance between the history and what got an exceptional firm like Vista to the place it is now, and then reconciling that with what you think the future should be. And frankly, and this is applicable to any job anywhere, how do you put points on the board? How do you put points on the board with your team? How do you put points on the board with your other business partners? How do you put points on the board with LPs? And sometimes they're very, very little things, but they're really important. When I look back over the first year, I'm very proud of what the team accomplished. I almost wish we had celebrated more of the points we put on the board. I think that's actually a good takeaway for anyone, frankly, in any role. At 95 billion, 600 plus employees, it must be hard to actually drive progress, like demonstrable incremental change. It is and it isn't. First of all, my team at NASDAQ was 700. So to have 600 people doesn't feel huge. Going back to the little wins, whether it's with the clients or internally or with the team, we implemented a technology tool for our financial close. It was reasonably light lift, but it made a real impact for the management company team. So something like that, just implementing different types of communications. We've I think added a lot around our valuation process. That's a super important area for our clients. It's a super important area for our internal teams. It impacts everybody from our investment teams to our fundraising team to our executive committee, making some small tweaks around the edges to that process to take some hours out of the system or to utilize technology can make a big difference. So I actually think you can make a difference at any size. 600 people is not huge. It's interesting because it is huge to the people that have been at Vista a long time, which is really interesting. This is the largest Vista's ever been. So it's certainly interesting to kind of reconcile where this is a very large organization versus those of us who have come from larger organizations where it's small and still sort of in its institutionalization process. And is that a function of just building out a great team of teams? This is a people business for sure. And figuring out how to motivate the team, how to add capabilities to the team while keeping them motivated to make sure that they're focused on the right priorities. Without question, that would apply to finance or frankly, any part of the organization, probably at any organization. So you got to have the right people in the right seats. And you want them to be in the right seats because you want them to thrive and grow. I think technology is a big part of it too. 
I know I'm singing from the hymn book as an enterprise software investor, but the software is so much better now. And frankly, the utilization of data and the data that we have to sit on and produce from our portfolio companies all the way through our reporting, it used to be a nice to have. And really now it's foundational. And when you think about the operational alpha, you get technology, you plug that in, but how much does an additive people component actually make that successful? Every implementation requires people wanting to implement change. There's a change management with all of this. So that's obviously critical is making sure that people are on board with the change, can see the direction that we need to go, that we're communicating whatever change it is, both internally and externally. So there's definitely a people component, but there's also going back to those small wins, there's also an ability to actually see what the leverage can do to a person's day-to-day job and then see how that data can be so powerful for, again, going back to the customers, if you keep the customers in the forefront and those are our limited partners, how that data can be leveraged to provide better, faster, more interesting analytics to our investors. If you want to call it alpha, that's where the alpha is. I like to joke with my other fellow CFOs, this isn't the secret sauce. For instance, what treasury system we use, not secret sauce. Very, very bad if you choose the wrong one or have an issue. So there are some things where having that network of support to bounce things off of is really critical. What's a snapshot of the team composition and accountability? When you look at all of these firms, everybody has to have what I would call like the management company level. So that's the people that make sure that payroll is paid and that t and is paid and is keeping the firm's accounts, budget, fp a forecasting. That's critical just as far as running the firm. And then most firms have a separate, as do we, a separate team that focuses on each of the fund strategies. So we have our Vista public strategies, our credit strategies, and our private equity strategies. And then within those teams, I think that's where it can take a different look depending on size. So we're actually the point where our size is such that we are separating the true accounting and reporting. When you think about it, the financial statements, that's a very regular scheduled program. You know exactly when all of your due dates are. And by the way, the SEC may change the due dates. You know exactly when your due dates are based on your LPA. And then there's what I would call more of whether you call it fund management or fund operations. That's how do you close a deal? How do you make sure that you're doing your IRR and your performance calculations? And the SEC passed some new rules last year that required different performance calculations. So the entire industry had to wrestle with those. We are to a size now where the separation of those activities is really important because you can only push so much through a channel at any given point in time. And if you're closing deals and closing a fund and have diligence and you're trying to issue your financial statements and you're getting ready for your annual meeting, it's a lot to push through the team. So that's the way we have the team set up. We've brought in some capabilities, as I mentioned, valuations. That's something that generally at a certain size, you have dedicated valuation expertise, both in credit and on the private equity side, and some performance capabilities and some other specific capabilities to augment the team. Is there anything you outsource? We actually outsource our fund administration. It's super interesting. It's something that I think the entire industry has wrestled with is the level of outsourcing versus insourcing. Vista is a longtime user of a fund admin, and that has been interesting to me because during my time at Carlisle, most of it was insourced. So they are very good partners and they've been very good partners, but it is a different relationship than when you own the accounting system in-house. Now, as a result of that, we've invested in Snowflake, which is something that a lot of the other alts firms have done as well. So a data layer that has a visual layer on top where you can pull out all of your information. I think it's going to be pretty standard as a way forward, whether you have the fund accounting system in-house or not. Take us through a typical deal from your perspective in a CFO seat. We've got a separate tax department too, and the tax people are immediately involved in the deals early. The fund finance teams are really side by side with the deal teams, whether it's on any of the fund strategies. That can mean everything from what are our restrictions within our LPAs for investments? How much capital do we have available? Do you utilize a subscription line? What's our balance and availability there? Deal structuring, and that's where tax is definitely involved. And the fund finance and tax folks work really closely with our legal investment team. 
and the deal team. Then you get to like the close and they're doing everything from funds flow, making sure the legal entities are set up, the bank accounts are open. The capital call allocation is reviewed, everything to get the capital in. When does a deal hit Lauren's radar? It could either hit my radar from the team because there's something unusual that happens. And when I say the team, whether that's from our head of investments on the legal side or whether that's from our fund finance or whether that's from tax, it could also hit my radar from the deal team. It could hit my radar at the time of the first IC. It could kind of hit at different times depending on the complexity and depending on, frankly, whether I'm additive. We do a lot of investments actually into the CFO's office. So to the extent that I'm additive, it might hit my radar earlier. But from just a pure play structuring oversight of the finance team, I would say it hits at one of those points in time during the process. There's also an executive committee, if I understand. What does that comprise of? Committee is really the body that looks at strategy of the organization, looks at how we're serving our customer, deals with people. We are a people business, so that's all of our internal people. It deals with our strategic direction. We talk about risks. It's really the governing body of the firm. And it's an important function. And I think as most GPs institutionalize, some sort of governing body like that is put in place to ensure that there's broad oversight and decision making. And just given the growth of the organization, obviously you talk about being very kind of LP centric. Do you get involved with the fundraising and due diligence process at all? I do. And actually, that's one of my favorite parts about the job for a bunch of reasons. Number one, it's always interesting to hear what's on the LP's minds, whether that's a focus on valuations or whether that's a focus on investments or whether that's a focus on more of the governance matters that exist in the LPAs. But someone from my team and usually me participates in almost every operational due diligence meeting that occurs. Oftentimes we will have a separate section for valuation. That's just how important the valuation process has gotten. But there's always a focus around our operations. And that's everything from our accounting to our use of Gen 2, to who our auditor is, to what our cash controls are. So it's kind of all the guts of how we operate our finance department. Because keep in mind, when you think about an operating company, finances go back to the management company responsibilities. It's running the firm, it's paying people, it's keeping the lights on, it's signing the lease. But in the alts world, it's also responsible for that customer service and customer success of all of the financial documents that are produced for the LPs. So it's a super interesting part. I almost always come away with something interesting that's top of mind, or frankly, often a best practice that an LP will mention, which is very, very helpful for me to take back to the team. And on the process, obviously you have a very diverse LP base. Is there something that people tend to focus on more today in general than they used to five years ago? Yeah, it's interesting. I think the sophistication level of our investor base has dramatically increased. And I think that's reflected in a couple of areas. One, timeliness of reporting. Two, depth of reporting. We produce an enormous amount of information for our LPs, so much that I actually asked our LPAC if they were using it all. I mean, things like the details around ARR, the details around our net retention, the details around our debt covenants, the details around strategic developments in the C-suites of the portfolio companies. Vista has a longstanding and I think pioneered the whole notion of a value creation team that goes in and helps the management teams. And that can be everything from C-suite to go to market, to sales, to product strategy. And we share what we are doing with the portfolio companies to our LPs. That's an enormous amount of data. It's interesting because it feels like it's not even enough, which is interesting to me. So I think that has dramatically changed when you think about the sophistication of LPs five, 10 years ago to now. When you think about the due diligence process, and I was reading a little while ago about the acquisition of Frank by JP Morgan and some issues with validating the revenue sources. Do you guys think about that stuff and say, okay, what are we doing differently? Stuff like that. Does it shift the industry at all? Or do people have a pretty good handle on that topic? So I think I can be the hype person for our investment team on this one. Because it is vertical and only enterprise software, the ability to assess the quality of revenue is extraordinary from the deal team. And it's interesting because it doesn't matter whether it's a small enterprise software company. So our smallest fund invests in 10 million to 100 million ARR or the large 
they're all looking at enterprise software. They're all assessing the retention and the stickiness of the revenue. And so they can get to that quite fast. And I think that's something that's been super interesting to me coming from a more horizontal firm that invests across geographies and across sectors to one that is exclusively in one sector and very deep. The ability to assess the quality of revenue is incredible. I could say the same thing for the ability to assess the management teams. I could say the same thing for ability to question the SAM and the TAM, how big the market is and whether the product has the right product fit in the market. Same with the acquisition thesis or the M&A plan, listening to every IC and the debates that happen at the IC around exactly that topic has frankly been a great learning opportunity for me. I share that often with operating MDs and the investment MDs, like sometimes the best debates are the best way to really get to that heart of what you're getting at, whether it's people or M&A plan or the stickiness of the revenue. I know that there's some people who do this technical due diligence on this stuff. Is that something you guys have built out in-house just given your tenure in the space? Yes. Vista was the pioneer of, it used to be called the Vista Consulting Group, and it's now the value creation team. And it literally is operating experts, whether they're in cyber or AI or people or go-to-market or the financial operations. And they are part of every diligence. And then they're also part of the thesis after the acquisitions made on the best practices and how to implement them at the company. And they participate, by the way, on the IC. I mean, you will hear whichever operating MD or value creation team member talk about the specific issues. I think Vista was one of the pioneers in that. I think a lot of the other GPs have now built out portfolio operations teams. They kind of manifest themselves in different ways, but Vista is all in on that. Let me shift back to your role and what skills do you believe are often overlooked and undervalued as a CFO? It's such a good question. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, a CFO, like other members of the C-suite, are responsible for building teams and motivating teams. So first and foremost, they have to be really good assessors of talent, really good motivators. And when you think of a CFO, you think of more of like the traditional audit partner type. And by the way, not to say that that's not a skill set that you need, but people underestimate the need for the ability to build teams. I think people underestimate the ability to understand technology and how to enable technology, especially now, maybe 20 years ago, not so much, but now I just don't know how you sit in a CFO seat and don't have some sort of strategic vision around the technology to enable the team. And at the end of the day, CFOs are operators, right? They sit in a risk seat, in a control seat, in a business enablement seat, and a customer facing seat. All of those things are really important and they all have different requirements. You really have to be multidimensional. Let's say I get a job in that seat and I know a little bit, but I'm curious. Where do I go? Well, first of all, the fact that you're curious, I think is an important characteristic because having that growth mindset and that intellectual curiosity is like the only way to survive. I think number one, wherever you get your seat, so whether it's small or whether it's large, you have to be intellectually curious about learning what people think the organization needs. And then you have to balance that with your experience. And you have to balance that with what you think the organization needs. And you have to triangulate those things. And then you have to assess your team and you have to figure out where do you need to invest? Where do you need to bring coaches in? I'm a big believer in executive coaches to develop people. Where are teams too thin? Where have they not been scaled? How do you get people on board with bringing capability in? And that goes back to that people aspect of it. It's like every role you have to take a growth mindset and you have to learn and you have to listen and then you have to be decisive. So you have to be able to make decisions. One of my former mentors told me, whenever you know you need to make a decision from thereafter, you're just wasting time. It's interesting to think about because it's true. I could give you multiple examples of that. It impacts people. So it impacts people you know you should bring in. It impacts technology you think you should implement. It impacts changes to the organization you think you need to make. I could go on and on. When you know, you know. How important is it to have a peer network? I find it to be one of the most important things you can have. I go back to what I said earlier. Some of what the CFO's office does and what our finance teams do is not secret sauce. And frankly, we all serve the same clients. That's the crazy part. You sit across from one of the pensions and they literally invest in, you know, You could put 10 CFOs in a room and they invest in all of us. So we're literally all serving the same clients. So I find a lot of it 
to be something that is both easily shareable and frankly makes us all better and makes us serve the clients better. I'm sure there are things that shouldn't be shared and those things don't get shared, but the network is extremely important to me. And I will tell you, when I took the CFO seat at Vista, there is a very established CFO network and what I would call the mid to large size private funds. And they are extremely welcoming and they've been extremely helpful. I kind of can't imagine going through some of the things without that group to bounce things off of. Thinking about your team, what do you look for in team members when you're hiring? It definitely is reflective, I would say, of the maturation of where your firm is. So what I would answer should not be the same as probably what my former firm CFO is going to answer. He's going to have a totally different need because his team is much, much bigger in their public. So when I looked at the team, I would say a couple of things. I am a big believer that you have to have diversity of thought on a team. And that can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. But I think it's really important because otherwise it's an echo chamber. For a while, you could hire only out of big four. But then at some point in time, maybe you need to hire out of other firms to bring in best practice firms. So that's an example of diversity of experience. And then wherever you are in your life cycle of institutionalization, there is change. So I believe you have to have people that have a growth mindset, that are willing and able to change, that sort of ask the question of why are we doing this? And by the way, it's hard when you've been in an organization a long time. So having that mindset is really, really important. And my leadership team has embraced it, and I'm really grateful for that. And then the people we're bringing in, we sort of have enabled to basically go back to that balance of learn the Vista way, and let's make sure we understand why we are where we are, and then bring to us things you've seen and best practices you've seen and technology you've implemented or leveraging data you've seen, and let's bring those together to continue to innovate. You've been at Vista for a year. Any suggestions for somebody who's parachuting into a well-established firm? I would say, make sure you spend the time listening. Make sure you prioritize your roadmap. Make sure you balance that balance of what you think the organization needs and what the organization thinks it needs. And if they're not aligned, figure out how to bring them together. And then one area I could have done better, and I, I mentioned this earlier, is celebrating the small wins when we had them and making sure that one of the most important roles of any role in a C-suite, certainly a role of a CFO when you drop in, is making sure that you are communicating how your progress is. Because some of it is behind the scenes and it's going to take a while and there's a roadmap and there's a technology implementation and you don't see the leverage of it, but you're still advancing it. There's a notion of praising the progress. And I think that's an area that you have to do. So once you get your roadmap nailed down, making sure you're praising the progress as you move along and just really getting to know your business partners. I have some wonderful business partners here and they help when you're trying to kind of figure out the organization because there may be some reason why things are the way they are and that's important to the culture and you're going to leave it like that. That's great. Talking about inclusivity and PE and I mean, Vista's reached gender parity last year, which is I think a huge milestone. How do you keep that momentum? Yeah, what's really fascinating about the way Vista has done everything is, and it really stems from Robert is an engineer. And so everything is structured so that it is measurable and repeatable and scalable. So you can pick any piece of diversity. We have an extraordinary leader on our board diversity program, Bessie Watts. I think 92 plus percent of our boards now have a person of color and I think it's 85 have a female. That is because Bessie, with the support of the organization, put in a structural program to make sure that company by company we go through. It's measured, it's reported to the EC, people's incentive is based on it. So it's all about putting the structure in place so that it's scalable. And that Vista has done extremely well. And that applies at our companies, at our boards of our companies, and within our firm. That's the way you have to maintain the momentum. Any advice on working with an investment-oriented founder? Yeah. I mean, I think whenever you join a firm, you have to understand what motivates the founder, what motivates the executive team, where the firm is going, what's the vision, mission, purpose of the firm, and what you can do to enable that growth. And you have to understand the way they think about operations or the CFO's office. And if you want to change the way they think about that, you have to figure out how to align what you're doing with where the firm is going. It's not here, but in many cases, there's probably an orientation of 
we just have to make sure that our financial statements are out and that we get our investors what we need. And that's okay. Then grab that and do that really, really well. And then take it to the next level and get LPs extra information or get it more timely. And then you can start seeing the cycle because at the end of the day, you work for your founder, of course, but you also work for your LPs. So I think there's ways to change the orientation, but you really have to focus on what does that founder want to see and what's important to driving to where they want to take the firm. It does differ firm by firm, as evidenced by the fact if you had 10 CFOs all on this call right now, and you asked all of us what our priorities were, we would all probably answer something different. And a lot of that is driven by our founders. This has been a really wonderful conversation. We close with two questions. My first question for you is, what is your superpower? I definitely am a problem solver. I have played games and I think it dates back to my grandparents beating me in gin rummy, but I like to solve problems. I absolutely like to solve problems. I do have a growth mindset. I like to learn. I like to think about what's next. I like to think about where things are going. And then third, and it sounds soft and I really wrestle with this, but I am a caring and empathetic leader. I really am. I want to see my team succeed. I want to see others succeed. And the longer I've been in the industry, and frankly, the later I am in my career, I get a lot of joy out of seeing other people's success. I get the greatest joy when people that I worked with years and years ago are finding success and I will see them and they will say, you made such a difference for me. And it's something very, very small. And it goes back to, you just never know when you're making an impact. And so all the more reason to constantly be focused on helping others succeed because you never know when you move someone out of your division. I moved someone out of my division when I was running the division at Carlisle and he went on to make MD and he wrote me the loveliest note. And he was like, you deciding that it was going to be best for me to move, change the trajectory of my career. And you know what? I get like so much joy out of that. It was really for him, it was a short-term negative, long-term positive, but he didn't see it. It was definitely me giving up an extremely talented young professional, but because he shifted, he went on to be wildly successful and I wasn't going to be able to offer him that. So when I see people that aren't in their right spot and I help them get to the right spot where they can flourish, that just gives me such joy. And now it's actually manifested itself into my network too. The word network kind of has a negative connotation. So I'm just going to call them my friends. I love to see the success of my friends. It's this awesome, vicious cycle of joy because when they're successful, honestly, it breeds other people's success and it becomes this cycle. And that has been really, really fun for me. There's a vicious cycle about women investing in other women whether that's within their career or whether that's in their firms or whether that's in women-led companies, there's not enough capital going to back women founders and women founders of private equity firms. It's been something that I've been focused on dating back to Carlisle. I was definitely focused on it at NASDAQ. We actually had an initiative to produce the data showing women-backed capital or women-backed managers. And I think that's an area of the future where there's a cycle of capital as well. Vista is one of the first founder in Girls Who Invest. Girls Who Invest is an awesome organization. I'm happy to be the hype person. We are one of the largest sponsors. They train women in college how to run models, how to really excel and flourish within financial services. And Vista has, I think, eight to 10 Girls Who Invest interns every summer. It is a wonderful organization, and it's actually building the pipeline of women coming through that can later become the investors of the future. And my last question is, what is the one industry book or resource you most commonly send to people? So I have three authors that I recommend the most. Carol Dweck, which is interesting because we've been talking about a growth mindset. I think that's core. I mentioned I'm a rabid reader, so we could spend 10 minutes on my reading list. But the other two I find in business are really helpful is Brene Brown. She is a Texan like myself. Dare to Lead was a formative book for me. And then Adam Grant. I love everything that Adam puts out in the way that he thinks about rethinking everything. That was his most recent book. But those three industry resources to me are how you think about your leadership style. And then if you're just talking about industry publications for private equity, generally, there's so much reading out there to be done. It's hard to actually narrow in on things that are private equity related. I read everything I can get my hands on. Lauren, this has been a wonderful conversation, wide ranging, deep diving. Thanks for your time. 
Thank you for having me, Scott. I enjoyed it and I'm so appreciative that you're shedding light into the nuts and bolts of operations at these firms. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one and see you next time.